I am very pleased to welcome, at an appropriate social distance, Naomi Klein, Senior Correspondent at The Intercept, Gloria Steinem Chair in Media, Culture and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University and critically acclaimed author. So that is a CV that could please even Bengali parents. Uh, Naomi, thanks for joining me. (laughs) Well, tell them I'm a university dropout and they'll they'll be shattered. Um, It's so good to see you and to do this with you. I am absolutely not telling my mum that you're a university dropout. I'm going to say that you were pre-med and that'll be good enough for her. (laughs) Um, So, you know, there was this little election in a, you know, the backwater that is the American empire, um, not even a week since it was called for Biden. And yet there's still all this litigation about whether the Democrats had a good or a bad result. And there's a view amongst some liberals that the historic popular vote win and the electoral college margin means that it's just unequivocally a good result. You shouldn't talk about Biden having scraped it. And then there's a view amongst some establishment House Democrats that the underperformance down ballot was really the left's fault and Black Lives Matter's fault. And then there's the view that you take, which is the election should have been an absolute sweep for the Democrats, but they cocked it up on every front. So I guess my first question for you is, what should Biden have delivered and why didn't he? Um, so first of all, I, I don't think it is just on, on Biden. I think it is, um, it, 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 the responsibility is shared by the top of the ticket for sure, but also by uh, the Democratic leadership that is currently in power, right? So this isn't, um, the way Democrats govern is not an abstraction to American voters because the Democrats have the majority in the House right now, and Nancy Pelosi is the leader of the House. And so, um, and so, when they are making a decision about who to vote for, and I mean, I don't know. I feel like I have to give a million caveats before to analyzing voters. There's so many factors. Um, And we have to acknowledge that Donald Trump has a very large and emboldened base. Um, And when it comes to his sort of fanatical fans, there's absolutely no doubt that a huge factor at play is white supremacy and misogyny and all kinds of things that there's no point sort of being strategic about, like it actually needs to be confronted and and defeated. Um, there There are voters who... I do believe would have voted for a different kind of democratic ticket. Um, we saw, we, we, we've seen Trump get a, uh, a much larger share of the Latino vote, for instance. Um, and the most disturbing result, I think, for the Democrats, and, and, and this is true for Biden, but, but like I said, also true for Pelosi, for Schumer in the Senate, um, is that the issue that voters in exit polls um, cited most as being their most important issue was the economy. No big surprise. It wasn't a majority of voters. I think it was around 30 percent. But it, more than any other issue, including the pandemic, the economy was uh, said to be the, the most important issue for voters. And of the voters who said that, 82 percent of them voted for Trump. So they saw Trump as being a better um, protector of their economic interests. And that should be very worrying for a party that makes claims to represent working people. A lot of the analysis I've seen in elite media has has focused on, um, well, Trump is still riding this claim that he was good for the economy before the pandemic, right? Um, I don't think that that is the main issue. In the, in the, in the, we- in the final weeks of the campaign, Trump relentlessly pounded this message that he stood for opening the economy back up, putting jobs first, and Joe Biden was Mr. Lockdown. Um, And the the, the Democrats' uh, messaging was all about, like, we listen to science. Yes, we are the serious people. We are the educated people. If the science says lockdown, we will lock down. Um, And they were counting on... The fact that so many people had died and 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 we are in this unprecedented crisis that that people would be okay with that, but they didn't talk about what they were going to do for people in that lockdown. I mean, there was no talk of of the kind of salary supports you have in the UK, right? I mean, you have a conservative government that that I think is covering eighty percent of people's salaries. 
in Canada, you know, we have a government that's that's giving people to to two thousand a month. Um, the Democrats have just abandoned people, and that includes Nancy Pelosi. Mm-hmm. They they absolutely criminally um, went along with the Republican plan to first hand out trillions of dollars to corporations and the rich, and then we'll worry about people after. Pretty much, I mean that there was uh, there was there as, as AOC said, there were crumbs for for families in the in the first bailout packages. But it's just like the most basic. Uh, a, a crime of, of negotiation. Like you don't first give it all away and then say, oh yeah, later later on, we're going to make sure that people aren't evicted from their homes, um, that people have their health care taken care of, um, that gig, gig workers are taken care of, that small businesses are taken care of. They didn't do any of that. And so, you know, I think a lot of people, and this is the worrying part, um, you know, voted for Trump because they associate the Democrats with this sort of self-righteous um, mask as signifier of virtue, lockdown as lifestyle choice. I mean, it's it's been encoded in this sort of um, cultural discourse, right? Whereas if you're just very clear from the beginning, look, you're, you're going to be taken care of if we lock down temporarily while we beat this thing, which is the way every government who has had effective results, has done it, um, then you 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 know you drain a lot of the energy away from these debates. So um, I think that that was one of the biggest. I think that's just emblematic of the ways in which the Democratic Party has systematically failed to understand the depths of economic crisis that people are, fa- are facing, and and they do it on every front. But the pandemic has heightened it. But I mean, there's something interesting there, right, which is Joe Biden has been praised for big tent politics. And one of the things that I've seen identified in elite media is that they've said, well, he's ignored and sidestepped and evaded culture war issues. He's not gotten into that kind of values driven micro event uh, brouhaha. But I think that he's actually tilted almost entirely into culture wars. His pitch was about the soul of the nation. It was about listening to Mm -hmm. science, as you said. It was about uh, lockdown as a signifier of your own regard for expertise and very little in the way of the material support and the economics. So you end up in a position where pandemic management becomes polarized and congeals kind of around these two culture war kind of positions. Unlock, prioritize the economy, don't wear a mask because you love freedom. Also, by the way, I did give you a stimulus check. And then on the other Mm -hmm. hand, it's, you know, Nancy Pelosi can quite happily lock down with her double fridge and $12 ice cream. cream. Yeah. The amount of damage she did with that, with that ice cream, you know, I think is, 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 is yet to be calculated. I don't know if we'll ever truly understand it, but I do think that it's very important to understand how divisive she personally is because right out of the gate, we heard this push to blame AOC and blame Ilhan Omar and blame the squad and, 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 and you know, moderate Democrats who lost their races turned around and said, never talk about socialism again, never talk about Medicare for all again, never talk about the Green New Deal again. This hurt us. Um, and now... Uh, as, you know, Justice Democrats, I think, are the ones who did this, but pulled together a lot of the attack ads from regional media markets and found that it's not AOC in all the ads, it's Nancy Pelosi in all the ads, right? So we are in the grips of this sort of frantic narrative war. Um, and the stakes of it are really, really high because in those moments, where, as you know, right after the election loss or scrape by, um, the the narrative gets set in stone, uh, and and I think that that the the corporatist Democrats have, uh, have been we're, we're the first out of the gate, right? And so, you know, I, I, it's it's been a bit of a heartbreak actually to watch the people who worked their butts off in this campaign, mm-hmm. who didn't do virtual campaigning, who actually knocked on doors, did incredible organizing, like AOC, like Ilhan Omar, like Rashida Tlaib, having to spend what should have been a moment of just like okay, you get to like take a day off frantically fighting these messaging wars on Twitter and in the media because they see the potential of 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 having these issues be sacrificed, right? Like never talk about the Green New Deal again. And and the other thing I think where where I do think we are in a better position is I think we've got better research right now. Um, and groups like Data for Progress, and as I said, you know, Justice Democrats, different 
um, fairly new organizations have been ready with the data, you know, to show that actually um, voters who endorsed the, had endorsed the Green New Deal uh, overwhelmingly won their seats. Voters who had endorsed Medicare for All had overwhelmingly um, won their seats. So it was just bullshit, right? It was just opportunistic bullshit um, and, and an attempt to go on the offensive so that you yourself are not under scrutiny. But I mean, just because it's bullshit doesn't mean it won't gain purchase, right? So there's, no, not a lot no. of, there's not a lot of yeah. evidence to back up these claims that if you supported the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, uh, that it was a turn off that would mean that you would lose uh, your seat and what have you. There's actually evidence for the contrary. But it's a useful pretext to punch left and to marginalise the party's progressives. So what leverage do progressives and socialists have in a Biden presidency to pursue policy goals? Mm -hmm. I think that remains to be seen. Um, I, th you know, I think we're going to have to see a much higher level of organization and coordination um, among. So, you know, here's here's the way I see it. This is all very familiar terrain. I mean, Joe Biden ran a nostalgic campaign as Barack Obama's vice president. Um, let's turn back the clock. Let's, you know, let's let let's go back to the pre-Trump uh, sort of utopia. Um, but of course, Joe Biden is not Obama. Joe Biden was put on Obama's ticket to reassure elites that oh, they didn't have to be afraid of Obama, right? Obama chose Joe Biden precisely because he is seen as a, this very, um, you know, centrist, bipartisan, loving, non-threatening. Um, so we know the kinds of, of decisions that Barack Obama made, you know, surrounding himself with Larry Summers and Tim Geithner and all of these Wall Street figures in the middle of a crisis that they themselves had created. And basically after, after that, every, everything was downhill. Um, but that said, um, we are in, uh, we are in a different situation. Even though this is a familiar dynamic here with with Biden, movements are not in the same position that they were when Biden and Obama came to power. You know, DSA barely existed. I mean, I think they had a few thousand members. They were not a political force. Just as Democrats didn't exist when Obama came to power. Um, uh, um, you know the the working families party existed but nothing to the extent that that that, that it that it that that it has political power now the squad didn't exist during the obama years right um and that is a result of those political organizations um you know occupy happened during 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 obama's presidency the first black lives matter uprisings happened during during obama's uh, uh, a presidency standing rock the keystone xl protests this fossil fuel divestment movement sunrise like these are all products of of that era, right? So that's why I've been sort of trying to remind people, because I think we all have PTSD a little bit, <laughs> that they may be the same, but we are different, right? Mm. Um, and so your question of like, okay, what's our leverage? I don't think we know because I don't think we've actually um, organized ourselves in a way to summon the full power represented by all of these forces, right? So I think that our movements are still too siloed on issues um, as opposed to um, coalesced around a coherent vision. Um, and even the squad itself is is largely an ad hoc group of like-minded colleagues. It isn't a, an organized political bloc yet. So now you have you know, AOC, um, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib all fought fierce primaries, right? Where 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 they had they they had they were primary by by um, politicians who had a lot of money. They've come back with a really powerful mandate. So it wasn't just that they were reelected, that, you know, because they, people tried to, to dismiss a lot of this as a as a as a, um, you know, a bit of a fluke. They didn't see them coming. They didn't really prepare. Now they prepared and they actually have a bigger mandate. So they're coming back more powerful and they're bigger. So you've got people like uh, Cory Bush, who I campaigned with on the Sanders campaign. I mean, D.C. doesn't know what's coming when it comes to Cory Bush. You know, she is a nurse. She was a street medic during the Ferguson uprisings. Um, she is a very, very, very powerful activist, extremely accountable to those com communities. Um, Jamal Bowman, an educator. So you have like, you know, people from the care economy, from the care sectors mm -hmm. who understand the brokenness. Um, so 
what we need more coordination from them. We need more coordination, I think, between Justice Democrats, DSA, Working Families Parties. And I think at the social movement level, we also need more coordination. What kind of leverage we can muster remains to be seen because like we haven't done that yet. But I think we're I think people understand that and and we'll see. But I think like what, what I what I think we need to replicate and grow exponentially, okay, is that moment when the Democrats won back Congress, they were expecting a, a parade, and instead they got the Sunrise Movement <laughs> occupying Nancy Pelosi's office before she'd even, you know, been elected as speaker, but everyone knew she was going to be the new speaker. Um, and, and AOC, who, who herself hadn't been sworn in, going to the office occupation, high-fiving them, promising to bring in a Green New Deal, right? That sort of inside-outside pincer, right, of the squad on the inside and the movements, you know, doing direct action on the outside uh, and, and targeting establishment Democrats. If we can replicate that dynamic and grow it, I think we could have a significant amount of, of leverage. But I think there's it's a moment of real danger because... Um, Biden's appeals to working class voters did not work nearly as well as his appeals to suburban voters, right? So if we're just looking electorally who he may feel accountable to, um, thankfully, he doesn't feel accountable to the, she shouldn't feel accountable to the Republicans because they overwhelmingly stayed with Trump, right? Um, but he did make some gains with wealthy suburbanites, more so than with working class voters. And that's not a good recipe when you're dealing with somebody like Joe Biden. So we have our work cut out for us. I mean, it's also all about how you define unity. So Biden is claiming that his mandate is a mandate for bipartisan cooperation and for unity. And one of the things that I was asking myself is, well, what does this even mean when your opponent hasn't even acknowledged your win yet? When, you know, the Republicans aren't interested uh, in unity or consensus. In fact, when, you know, Barack Obama comes in, there is a absolutely, you know, died in the wall of resistance to him at every single level. It was, you know, intended to break his presidency and break him as a man. That was where they were at. Um, so what do you make of these calls for unity? Are they merely misguided uh, political strategy? Um, you know, the kind of lovey-dovey uh, instincts of, you know, peace and love leading people in the wrong direction? Or is it a reflection of a vested set of elite interests and trying to restore those to, you know, 2016, uh, pre-2016, you know, normality? Yeah, I think it's the latter, actually, <laughs> as I think you know. Um, yeah, I mean, what this is an elite unity that they're talking about. Um, it is not unifying um, working class people across divides of race and religion and gender. I mean, this is the kind of unity work that we really need to do if we're serious about healing. Um, and about repairing uh, deep, deep rifts. It's it's a papering over um, in the interests of those elites because, yeah, the, the United States has two ruling class parties, um, and 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 Joe Biden is a representative of one. Um, I take solace from the fact that he is extremely out of step from the base of his party. That there continues to be a huge amount of. Um, you know, support for the policies that Bernie Sanders represented and, and, you know, having campaigned for Bernie and, you know, acted as a surrogate for him. And, you know, I went to five states during the primaries with the campaign and talked to a lot of voters and met a lot of people who, you know, frankly, who were very clear. I love Bernie. I agree with Bernie. I think he's totally right about Medicare for all and the Green New Deal. But, and the but was interesting. The but was 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 sometimes it was about just fatigue, you know, we need a transition period, you know, and that was one of Joe's pitches, right? Like, I'm a placeholder, I'm just gonna, like, you'll be able to take a breath and just relax, you know, and I think people are, were, are so beaten down at, at, by the Trump years. And here I'm talking about, you know, working class African American voters who I met in, in, in the Nevada caucuses who, who, who just said, like, can we just have a break? <laughs> you know, like I love Bernie, but can we just have this kind of in between break period? Um, but then there was also the but of 
of a, a deep understanding of the depths of of anti communism, mm. of red baiting, of of you know, particularly for older voters who who felt that they knew the country, right, better than these young Bernie kids, right. Mm. And who said, out of hard-won wisdom, and this is where I think that, you know, we can't just, like, attribute this all to, um, you know, the centrists we love to beat up on, right? It was, it was out of hard-won life wisdom, having survived, um, you know, the civil rights movement and seeing their leaders assassinated and, and seeing um, how the McCarthy era had destroyed, you know, working-class movements. Um, and divided the civil rights movement. They said this country will never elect a democratic socialist, right? You, 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 you are underestimating what is gonna what is gonna be thrown at Bernie. And and so, yeah, so I guess there's some hope in it, in the sense that it wasn't like an affirmative vote for the policies that Biden represented. It, it had to do with a fear of, of the power of that of anti-communism in the as an American tradition um, and I don't feel that the Sanders campaign ever did enough to sort of frontally address that right I mean I, I was arguing that we should have had ads like that were kind of funny and like you know reds under the bed and red scale like mm -hmm. that, that sort of put what Bernie was facing within the the, the, the history of red baiting and McCarthyism do it with a light touch but actually don't just say, don't worry about it, it's gonna be fine, but mm. actually talk about what the, what is the plan? Because this is a fierce force. And I think, you know, speaking with you, Ash, like, you know, the truth is that it, it I, what we had to fear was not, like, I think Bernie could have survived Trump's attacks as, because the Republicans attack every Democrat mm. as a communist. They did it to Obama, as you said, and threw in black nationalist uh, on top of it and said it was part of a vast plot, uh, plot to bring reparations to Kenya. I mean, they, they everybody gets the full backlash. The problem is they've been running candidates who don't offer the benefits, right? So you mm. get all the backlash against socialism, but you don't get the socialism. <laughs> um, so you know, this is why during the Obama years, I would argue, like, you're going to get you're going to get treated as if you're giving people reparations anyway. So why not do it? Mm. <laughs> Fox is acting like you're doing it. So why don't you do it? But the real issue is that it isn't the Republicans that Bernie had to worry about. It was the liberals. Right. But so I mean, they how, would have done that to him what they did to, Bert, to Corbyn. Mm. Right. Like that rolling coup that Corbyn faced. Mm. That is what would have happened within the Democratic Party had Bernie won the primary. And that's the thing I'm puzzling over. Like, how do we deal with that? But I mean, one of the things, and I think that this is particularly the case for voters of color, and it's something which I've heard again and again in the UK, and I think it's also something which has a, a resonance in the United States context as well, which is you do have these voters of color who go, well, I want these policies, but white Britain, white America are never yeah. going to go for them. So this, there's this element mm -hmm. of ventriloquism. You're deciding what's electable based on what you think is going to allay the fears of voters who've historically been best treated by this democracy. And that's not something I know how, how you break through. I don't know how you get to the point of going, well, maybe you should just do what you want and let's see what happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Um... <sighs> Yeah, I don't know either. Um, and I think, you know, I saw some of that within the, like, uh, you know, Bernie did not do everything perfectly by, by, by any means. And he didn't um, have a great operation um, reaching out to African-American voters, particularly older voters. Where he had a fearsome organizing machine that I saw myself was um, in, in, in reaching out to Latinos mm. um, and watching the, the Unidos con Bernie campaign mm. in Nevada, I, I started to see what that could look like. And, and it travels through the kids. It was quite interesting. You know, there was this strategy of, 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 of reaching the, 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 the children of the, of the sort of more, more uh, cautious parents 
Um, and, 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 and it seemed to really work. I mean, you, Latinos voted for, for Bernie overwhelmingly in Nevada. Um, and so I think it is possible to do, um, but I think we still have this problem of even, so, so Corbin did win the leadership, right? And he faced a sort of, from what I can tell on this side of the Atlantic, a rolling, never ending coup from the party establishment, right? Which m succeeded in making him seem, um, you know, just, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know better than me, but, but um, it's, it gradually wore down the support, right? And, and I think a lot of what I heard from voters around Bernie was, we're tired, right? And they knew that best case scenario, if Bernie won, it would just be a nonstop war, right? And so people are looking for some kind of a break, right? Like some kind of a being allowed to exhale. And, and so I think we need a way to communicate with people that acknowledges it is, it is a war. Like we don't get a break, right? Um, and there's, there's no way you actually get to a better place without having the actual conflicts with entrenched interests and they are going to fight because they have a ton on the line. Right. And, and so, yeah. And, but I think we, we need, we need better messaging on the unity question because people do want unity. So we have to talk about the kind of unity that we want. Right. Um, because if we don't really, really name that and give people a taste of it, then that sort of paper unity seems very appealing or as a sort of a second choice, right? Where so, so like that moment in, in, in the campaign where um, after Biden you know, won his first primary, right? Um, you have the whole phalanx of losing candidates surrounding him, right? That moment, right? Mm -hmm. Where, they, where, where all, all of, like not everyone, but, but a lot of them were all on stage with him. And it was this performance of elite unity um, against Bernie. Mm. Right. And people looked at that and said, OK, um, this looks like this, this 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 looks more appealing than fighting forever. <laughs> um, whereas what I what I what I was wished had happened in that moment. And this is what sticks with me. And I think why, you know, you talk to Bernie people and we're all a little bit, you know, we, we carry some grudges <laughs> is, well, who was stand like like. Where was Elizabeth Warren in that moment? Well, mm -hmm. she was in, she was giving interviews to Rachel Maddow about the Bernie how Bernie Bros were mean on Twitter. You know, mm -hmm. like um, where were where like Andrew Yang who said you know he wanted universal basic income and, and had been critiquing the Democrats for not speaking to working class voters. He was one of the first to endorse Biden, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, you know, or or. You know, none of the candidates who sort of position themselves as being more in the Bernie side sided with Bernie in that moment. Um, we needed more cultural figures who maybe could, but like we, like if they were all going to unify behind their centrist, we needed our own kind of unity that represented by the kind of movements that I, that, that I, that I um, was talking about earlier, these organizations that I was talking about. We have to be able to, to, to show people what a different kind of unity represents, I guess is what I'm saying. And I, I don't think we did that. It just kind of looked like they're all united against Bernie. You know? I mean, I, I get you on, on the exhaustion. I mean, I think after the five years of Corbynism, where I kind of went into it being a, you know, austerity motivated anarchist, and then suddenly I'm shilling for social democracy. And it really was one of those record scratch freeze frame moments of, you know, you're in some marginal scene, you're like, yep, that's me. How did I get here after, you know, being at the top of Millbank Tower um, 10 years ago, um, while Tory party HQ was getting smashed in? Um, that was you. But, I saw that video. <laughs> uh, I mean, that was, I was, I was 18 years old, and I uh, thought it was the most exciting thing that ever happened uh, in my entire life and probably was the most exciting thing that happened in my entire life. Um, but seeing the arc of what happened with Jeremy Corbyn and seeing how he was traduced first as he's too nice to hold the office of prime minister to by the end of it, there was the sense of he's a wrong un. 
right? He's a wrong in every way. Um, he's an anti-Semite, which is worse than a racist because it's got its own special name. Um, he's too close to the Muslims for comfort. One of the things that I heard uh, on the doorstep in 2019 uh, in a constituency which was 97% white, is that Jeremy Corbyn wanted all the Muslims to come and take over. And I was like, bro, have you seen a single Muslim in this town apart from me? And I've just come here. But the way in which like one's perception of, of your own neighbourhood yeah. is completely distorted through media coverage. Um, you know, Corbyn moved from being seen as, you know, too pacifist to being in league with the country's enemies you know him and osama bin laden were playing bridge together you know that kind of thing and mm -hmm. one of the things that stuck with me through that process is that the left didn't have strategy for combating that other than appealing to values ones of solidarity and kindness and wanting a better life, which just weren't hegemonic in the electorate. Much more powerful was the feeling of negative solidarity, of I'll do without better as long as someone who I deem unworthy doesn't get something they don't deserve. Yeah. And I wonder from across the Atlantic what you made of watching that. And if you could have advised Corbyn and his team, what would have been the thing that you would have said, do this differently or fight back in this way? Um, uh, that's a huge question. Um, I have to cast my mind back to it a little bit. Um, I do feel that there were ways that he could have addressed, I think there was a lot of cynicism in the um, claims of anti-Semitism, but cynical or not, it resonated with people. People felt it, right? Um, and I think that there was um, an important moment that was lost where um, there was a video that came out where it was sort of taken out of context. You'd remember it better than me, where um, it was something like, there was, some, there was a discourse around like, not, it was not really English. Do you remember when, when, yeah, when yeah, 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 yeah. So what that was, was he was trying to make a comment about a Palestinian man saying yeah. almost more English than the English because he understand irony, which Zionists yeah, 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 yeah. didn't. And yeah. that was then a huge moment because I think a lot of people in the Jewish community felt that that wasn't a limited comment on these specific individuals anymore, that it was saying that if you're a Zionist, you don't participate in English culture. You're not a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, I remember watching that and, and and what I felt could have happened. This is just one example. I, I felt like like rather than just talk about how that was taken out of context and it wasn't right, I thought it was a moment where Jeremy could have given a great speech about the, I the exclusive idea of Englishness, right? Mm -hmm. And who patrols the boundaries of Englishness that really spoke to the many, many, many people who have felt themselves on the outside of that, mm -hmm. right? Because it was a feeling. It's not, at a certain point, it's not about the facts. It's about the fact that people have experienced anti-Semitism in the UK. Um, you know, when I was there at Labour Party conference a few years ago and I was doing media and people were saying, well, what about the anti-Semitism? I was saying, look, Yes, there's anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. There's anti-Semitism in the Tory Party. There's anti-Semitism in British society. So it's everywhere, right? Um, and I think that that you have to be able to speak to that and 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 define another kind of Britishness that 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 that, that feels much more inclusive to people. And so, I think I wish he could have done that. But this points to a broader issue, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm probably going to say some things that I regret, um, but I would love to hear your That's time. exactly what we want. Come on. Talk recklessly to me. All right. And I, 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 look, I, I, as you know, like I, 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 you know, I supported Jeremy's campaign um, and, you know, not uncritically and I don't vote there. So, so you know, who cares what I think? Um, but I did get involved in Bernie's campaign in a way that I've never gotten involved in electoral politics. I've never, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I was a surrogate. I've never done anything remotely like that. 
the, the most I had ever done was like write a newspaper column about who, which, which candidate I thought was better than the other. I have never gotten involved in electoral politics the way I did for Bernie. And I did because and for the same reason I, I, I spoke at Labor Party conference because of climate change, because I think we need transformational politics a decade ago. But <laughs> given that we didn't get it then or two decades ago, we damn well need it now. And, and, and so I've gotten out of my comfort zone in order to, to do this work. Um, what I, I, Corbyn and, and, and Sanders are very, very different types of politicians, but I do think that they share something in common. And it's part of, I think, the appeal that they had for younger people um, was that they were, there was something about them that um, was was like a kind of a, a lovable cluelessness, right? Um, that allowed them to survive the 80s and 90s <laughs> relatively unscathed, precisely because they didn't have the kind of media savviness and because they had that sort of singular focus, right? Um, you know, I, I wrote a little bit about uh, about Corbyn as the kind of anti-brand, right? Mm. Um, where you know, if you had uh, um, Tony Blair as like the, new, the, the 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 politician who understood corporate marketing, applied the principles of corporate branding to a political party for the first time, rebranded labor, new labor, you know, this utterly meaningless phrase, labor scented, as opposed to actually representing <laughs> people. Um, and so Corbyn represented this return to the, the pre-branding era, the, the pre kind of media savvy era of just like, we're just going to, we're going to be the labor party as in people who labor, you know? Um, and, and, and I think that for young people who are so seeped in branding and marketing um, and, and self-referential communications, there was something really trustworthy about the fact uh, that sort of media cluelessness, and we saw something very similar with the Corbin with the uh, Sanders campaign, particularly in 2016, um, where where Bernie had that you know very um, same thing he's been saying forever, right? This is why uh, this is why I think after so many um, sort of test tube marketed politicians, these figures were more trustworthy, right? Because they have been saying the same thing for so many decades um, and that sort of message discipline. And yeah, Bernie's been talking about the millionaires and the billionaires, you know, for a very, very long time. And he continued to do that. And then all of this sophisticated comms work what grew up around him, much of it volunteer, right? Um, and I guess what I'm wondering is, Maybe we've gone as far as we can go down that particular road. I think it brought a lot of, I brought a whole new generation into politics. I, I actually brought in a couple of new generations into politics because Sanders and Corbyn were a different kind of politician and, 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 and were able to earn that trust. But their strength has also proven their weakness, right? That, that, that sort of intellectual rigidity or that sort of messaging rigidity. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. I think we should, I, I think it's good to be consistent, right? But you also have to be nimble. You also have to change with events. And so I wonder now whether perhaps we can say to Corbyn and to Sanders, thank you for, for bringing these new generations into politics, including a new generation of politicians in the squad who would not have done this work if it weren't for, for their example. Um, but if we are going to weather these tumultuous waters that you and I have been talking about, we act, we need leaders who are profoundly literate mm. when, ta when talking about race, when talking about gender, can seamlessly tell a story about the interrelationships between class and race and gender, and not just make a list of, of issues to tick off, but actually tell the story, right? Tell the story. Um, and... And, and, and pivot and weave and use social media and, 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 and be responsive. And I want to stress, like when I say pivot and weave, I don't mean change your position, mm. but respond to events as they're happening, right? Because I think that there's, that, that, that there's a frustration with that rigidity, which is also what we love about them, right? <laughs> um, 
where thing, dramatic things change and we're still sticking with the same message. And I don't think that that works well enough. So um, I don't think these are insurmountable problems, but I just don't think that we ha maybe had the leaders who could lead us through them. And I'm not throwing them under the bus, but I just think that um, that, that, that we, need, we need leaders who have the whole package maybe. Um, so apologies to our viewers who have noticed a real shift in lighting, but the deep state hacked my camera, so I had to switch to a different <laughs> one. Um, but I want to talk about this this thing that you identify, which is being able to talk about, talk in the registers of race and gender and doing so convincingly and not just because it's a long list of injustices which you rattle off and say you're going to fix. Um, because it seems to me that, particularly in America, every four years... Praise is heaped on black people for saving democracy from white nationalists. And then straight afterwards, you know, liberals, the elites, the establishment gets get right back to arguing that the demands and the material interests of those exact same black voters are completely untenable, unelectable. It's kryptonite to the suburbs. And there's this enduring sense of we want your vote, but on no account do we want to have to represent your interests. And then you've got, uh, you know, white politicians like Jeremy Corbyn, who did try and represent more the interests of, you know, voters of colour, particularly working class, uh, you know, Muslim voters of colour in the UK, and he was absolutely hammered for it. So one of the questions that I've been wanting to ask, you know, quite a few of the big hitters, uh, you know, on the other side of Atlantic is when, if ever, will America actually be a multiracial democracy? And how do you achieve that sense of inequality of legitimate political interests on the part of white voters, black voters, Latino voters, voters of color more generally? Right. Um I mean, if this would be a good moment to try, um, and you know, and I said like they're the same, but but we are different. Um, I think you're seeing an immediate pushback, right? Um, uh, in a way that maybe we haven't seen after elections, um, and 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 that pivot that you're talking about um, is it's not it's not it's not happening without a fight. I think the danger is that Joe Biden. Um, seems to believe that he can appease people with representation, right? Um, so he said, I, I, owe, I, I owe black people for my primary win, and I promise to elect a, to, to select a woman, and eventually he selected a, a black woman as his running mate. And he sees that as like like that is him paying back those voters, right? And now he's talking about if he gets to appoint a Supreme Court justice, he will support, a, he will appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court. And that's great. Um, but it is not the same as ensuring that every black person in America has health care. Um, and in fact, he is supporting policies that will actively prevent that, right? Um, so I think that this is the danger is, is, is whether or not there is going to be pushback against just the kind of representational response, because I think that we can expect the Biden administration to be very intersectional mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in <laughs> uh, uh, a, a friend of mine uh, tweeted, um, welcome to the age of intersectional empire the other day, <laughs> which was pretty uh, uh, harrowing and probably quite true. I mean, there was, um, a, there was yeah. a meme from uh, the Clinton campaign in 2016, and it was mm. you near know, the blonde lady maths meme of all of the like geometry and stuff. And it's when you're trying to think of how to make drones intersectional. Um, <laughs> right. Right. Kind of yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think that this comes back to what we were talking about earlier about what the leverage is, what the power is, because people are naming this in a way that they haven't uh, and, and pushing back, uh, including against the kind of tokenistic uh, um, appeasement. Right. Like it isn't just no, it's not enough just to appoint people to the highest levels of your administration. You actually need the policies that are going to materially transform the lives uh, of working people. Um, and the people getting the rawest deal in the United States are overwhelmingly black and brown. So this is about race. Um, and 
and I th and I think that this will, you know, as Ilhan Omar said, we get we get what we organize for, right? <laughs> so we have a lot of work to do on that front. Um, but it is, you know, it's Joe Biden. It is not going to be as he keeps reminding us, you know, um, you know, he's not Bernie Sanders. He's not. He beat Bernie Sanders. Uh, so, you know, I think it's 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 it's. it's when is that moment going to be? It's, I don't think it is going to be this moment. I don't think it's going to be this administration. But I think that what we can do at the movement level is 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 come together around that vision um, much more forcefully than we have in the past. Um, and a lot of that has started to happen during the Trump era, um, but not enough of it. And and that. You know, there's still, I think, a feeling of kind of scarcity um, in movement politics of like, you know, and, and a lot of that has to do with the way movements are funded. You know, people are competing over scarce resources. And so if it, it, it almost it mitigates against uh, collaboration because you want, you know, to claim that your movement won this and you get money from foundations for it. Um, and so, you know, we just need to talk openly about what are the systems that we're all locked in that are keeping us from organizing together. This is what was powerful about being part of the Sanders campaign is you caught a glimpse, right, um, in the way that, it, that, that, that Bernie brought together working class voters. You know, if you look at who donated to his campaign, overwhelmingly it was nurses, Amazon workers, Walmart workers. And, you know, the tragedy of it is these ended up being the quote unquote, you know, essential workers, the frontline mm. workers. They were already Bernie voters. Right. And they weren't trusted. I mean, this to me is the biggest heartbreak of what happened during the primaries is that is that Bernie did bring together a, multi, a multiracial coalition. Mm. It didn't go deep enough, but but it was there and you saw it. On, uh, you saw it at rallies um, and you saw it in who was donating to the campaign. But a lot of the people who speak on behalf of um, the, 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 those groups didn't trust their own members, like whether it was union leadership, um, you know, or whether it was NGO leadership, there was a sense of like, I actually kind of like a classism in that, mm -hmm. like you couldn't trust that, that, that those workers at Walmart, that those workers at Amazon, um, that those nurses actually knew what was best for them, you know? Um, and and that goes, I think, very deep uh, um, to, in, in the kind of left or progressive movement that we have, which is actually not a left. I mean, do you think that in part because the reactionary right have been very good at absorbing and, and capitalizing on the way in which 40 years of neoliberalism has transformed class composition? Because even just being able to say a multiracial working class coalition is something which not everyone on even the left accepts exists so yeah. one of the things that mm. i've been thinking is that you know 40 years of attacks on trade union organizing yeah. uh the demise of heavy industry and in former industrial heartlands is that one's perception of class identity is decoupled from the economic base so you've got this tilt towards thinking of the real working class being a small business owner who might own multiple properties but doesn't have a college degree therefore is more working class authentically than a temp doing data entry who rents mm -hmm. a box room which costs half of their salary and they're never going to own a house as long as they shall live. And the right has, has acknowledged that change and has leapt upon it. But the left and, and progressives more generally struggles with that. Yeah, and 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 a lot of it has to do with, who, with, with trade union membership. Um, and so, you know, who makes up trade union membership does not represent who the working class actually is. It's, it is much wider and it is much, much better off, uh, much more middle class um, than, than the, than the, than, and, and this is where I think um, COVID and the response to COVID presents a really powerful organizing opportunity that a lot of people have been stepping into, right? Because COVID made the actual working class visible mm -hmm. in a way that it is systematically invisibilized in our culture, right? Um, the And the whole discourse around essential workers is quite interesting, right? Because it was really just a rebranding of 
working class people that, that who, who who never were able to shelter in place. The people keeping the lights on, cleaning up the trash, taking care of people in hospitals. I mean, like, and obviously um, teachers on Zoom. I mean, but it was it was and and supermarkets and Amazon warehouses, um, and and so and and all the gig workers and delivery drivers and so on. So that's that's the current working class, the people who weren't able to lock down, mm. um, and. And they were treated and are still being treated so abysmally, right? And this is where it, it comes back to where we started in a way, which was, um, you know, I, I, and I'm really worried about it already with Biden. You know, the first thing he's done is he has struck this, this you know, high-powered scientific committee, right, to, 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 to develop their pandemic response. And it's filled with amazing uh, public health experts and, 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 and different scientists, but those people will tell you that you need a lockdown, but they will not tell you how to do it without sparking a massive backlash and, 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 and causing mass starvation. You need social policy for that. Right. Um, and so I think we need to be, because we are still in this pandemic. We are still in a moment of a mass death. Um, and that is, that is the working class, the people who are keeping us alive. And so that's who we need to be organizing. And, you know, we did a little video um, with Molly Crabapple, um, which was a sequel to the one we did with AOC. The, mm. these, we've done a couple of these videos that are sort of set in the future um, and sort of trying to tell the story of how do we get out of this <laughs> terrible place we're in, right? Um, when we did the first one with AOC, it was a little bit more straightforward, right? Because it was pre-election mm. and and the i and the idea was well basically you know we're going to we're, we're going to we're going to take power um and we're going to do this thing and now whatever whoever the we is we're not taking we are, we are not in power we are we are not biden um mm. and so we're still going to have to fight for this so what are our points of leverage and in the second video we kind of explored you know what an essential worker general strike would look like right mm. and um, and I think that that's where we need to be investing a lot of our energy. And I guess, like, just to bring this around a little bit more and, and thinking about the lessons of the Corbyn and Sanders movements, right? And your leap, right, from being that 18-year-old um, anarchist and shutting down Tory headquarters to suddenly, you know, campaigning for social democracy for Jeremy Corbyn, you know, maybe that's too big a leap, <laughs> and I say, like, like it, in the sense that I sometimes wonder, and I felt this when I was on the campaign with Sanders, of like, okay, did we skip some stages mm. here? Right? Like, 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 we 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 went straight for the top, right? Like campaigning yeah. for, in your case, for the prime ministership, in our case, for the U.S. presidency, um, and we knew that we hadn't done that sort of base organizing work to earn it. And we got a taste of what it would look like to all be kind of rowing in the same direction. And, and this sort of this, this multiracial working class coalition that you caught a glimpse of in the, in the Sanders campaign and in the Corbyn campaign, but the communities themselves weren't, weren't organized yet. And, and the Sanders campaign responded to that by saying, okay, he's going to be the organizer in chief. They're organizing as they go. But a presidential campaign is not the same mm. as as that as as actually organizing in workplaces in neighborhoods and building up that power that then can stay cohesive no matter what happens because i think that the the heartbreak and i don't know if you felt this in the uk as well is that when the sanders campaign was over with some exceptions we all just scattered back into our silos, right? Mm. And you, I don't think you should ever be reliant on a presidential campaign or a prime ministerial campaign to hold your movement together, right? Um, there's, that's much too precarious. And so maybe these years are about building up what that represented in a way that isn't reliant on any one politician's political fortunes. And I think that's a really beautiful place to, to wrap up. It's a 
hopeful with just uh, enough amount of bittersweet, um, you know, almost remorse to I think see people through on a Tuesday evening. Naomi, thank you so much. Uh, for joining us and I swear it's not just because I mis mixed you up for a uh, lockdown skeptic Naomi Wolf um, we <laughs> it was definitely awesome. I'm sure she would be happy to talk with you you know that's not that I, do you know that when I met with Alexis Cipras about I don't know six years ago uh, oh God I won't even tell you what he how he mixed me up so he I'll, let's just say he was more disappointed than you oh really was it Naomi Campbell <laughs> No, he, he, had, he, had, he had mistakenly said that um, at a public forum that he'd, he'd, he'd said, you know, what we're living through here in Greece is Naomi Campbell's The Shock Doctor. <laughs> and he was in conversation with Slava Zizek, who just sat there and went, <laughs> it's one of my favorite moments in left history. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like a huge promotion to both of you. So suddenly it's Naomi Klein, supermodel of the world, shot by Mario Testino and Naomi Campbell. Except when I show up, you know, I just show up and it's just like, sorry. Well, you know what? Actually, I lied. Um, my final question wasn't my final question okay. because I did outsource to Twitter. What would you ask Naomi Klein if you oh, had... Dear. Uh, the chance to and somebody did ask what is the skincare routine and seeing as I've pulled you into you know trivial waters with the Naomi Campbell thing I've got to put it <laughs> to you but oh Jesus oh um oh, what is the skincare routine that is very kind I, I I guess that means that they that they think I have a good skincare routine I don't I I'm not going to do this. I guess <laughs> if you turn around and say good genes, that you have absolutely decimated whatever goodwill you built, built up over the interview. You know, if you just go, I've got fantastic genes. That's it. No, no, um, no, 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 no. There are ridiculous numbers of creams involved. Um. <laughs> but you don't, you don't want a twelve dollar ice cream moment. I, I, I see, I see what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so on yeah. that note, right. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us. I will let you get back to your busy regimen of exfoliating, moisturizing, exactly. and whatever. Exactly. Some serums, some serums. Serum. So lovely. I can't believe this is the first time we met. It was such a pleasure. You're such a hero. Keep up the great work. Really lovely. And you know what? Hopefully when all this is over, I can come raid your uh, moisturizer cabinet in person. Um, Absolutely. We'll do sheet masks. Yeah, no product is safe when I'm in the house. Sticky fingers. <laughs> Take um, care. Ash.